this. The session goes for three. All right, wonderful. So um, our second presenter is now up on the screen. Um, hopefully he can hear us. Um, so welcome to the How First Nations and Yindis Are Changing the Game in Vancouver, BC panel. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys saw, as I saw on Twitter, the pretty amazing um, housing development that was proposed in Vancouver that was on uh, Squamish land. Um, that was how I was sort of, that was my first instinct when I heard about this panel. Um, and you'll be hearing about that a little bit uh, during this. But uh, I just want to start by introducing myself and introducing our panelists. For me, it's pretty quick. I am Heidi Hart. I am an organizer with Portland Neighbors Welcome here in Portland. That's kind of all that's about me that's relevant to this panel. Um, also, uh, please pardon me if I get any names wrong. Um, Daniel Alekasek, Alexiak, I'm so sorry, I, forgot, I practiced that beforehand, uh, who is a member of Abundant Housing Vancouver, a writer for Sightline, and a labor lawyer by day. And we also have um, Kasalem, who is uh, Zooming In, who is the chairperson of the Council of the Squamish Nation. So, uh, Daniel, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself first? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, um, as, uh, as Heidi said, I am a member of Abundant Housing Vancouver, right for Sightline. I'm a labor lawyer, and I've been doing, uh, helped start Abundant Housing Vancouver about five years ago. Um, and I've been doing um, kind of YIMBY um, community organizing ever since. Um, I worked before that for, in political organizing a little bit, um, and then no one at the time was really working on housing. So like uh, a lot of you, I, I got into the housing stuff that way. Um, and my part of the presentation today, I know a lot of you want to hear about Sanok and Kul Salem's amazing projects. I'm going to try to set some context in Vancouver, kind of the, the dinner, and then you can have your dessert and talk about uh, Sanok after. But I think some of the context about um, more broadly what's happening in Vancouver is going to be important first. OK, great. Uh, Kul Salem, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Okay, it seems like you might be on mute, or is there an issue with the sound, potentially? What about now? Yes, you're good. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, my apologies for not being there with you in person, unfortunately. I was planning to come. <laughs> I was looking forward to it. I haven't traveled much in two years. I don't know about anybody else. Um, but unfortunately, an emergency work matter. Uh, being an elected official, sometimes you don't have a life to yourself. Um, but I am here virtually. My name is Col Salem, uh, elected first in 2017 to my council as a councillor uh, for the government of my nation. And then in uh, September, just recently, elected as the chairperson for that council, which is an eight member uh, elected council serving a four year term. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I also, in another capacity, I'm on the board of directors, um, which is called the organizing committee, but I'm also on the board of directors for one of the uh, sort of leftist um, sort of, I would describe ourselves a bit as a democratic socialist kind of civic political party, um, which a lot of people don't know in Vancouver, because I kind of keep it a secret, so don't tell anybody. Um, but uh, it's another sort of volunteer capacity that I participate in these issues. Okay, wonderful. So the next thing we're going to hear from is a presentation from Daniel about the work that Abundant Housing Vancouver has been doing in Vancouver and just a lot of context about that. Uh, thank you. Can we get the uh, presentation up on the screen? Oh, thank you. I can't, I can't uh, see it because of the glare, but thank you. Okay, so this is a photo of Sanok, which Col Salem will we'll talk about later. In the foreground there, you can see all, um, these, these towers coming up at the south end of the Burrard Street Bridge in Kitsilano in Vancouver. Um, and this development model of big towers next to low-density homes um, is um, something called the Grand Bargain that Vancouver has been doing for about 30 years now, if not a little bit longer. 
where um, we have this really spiky development pattern, including in the suburbs. There's um, at, at Lougheed Town Center, I think, an 82-story tower going up about 15 or 20 kilometers from downtown Vancouver. And there's a whole series of these town centers, and it's, a, I, th I think, quite an interesting development model that I want to talk about a little bit, and also keeping in mind the political coalition behind um, what, again, has been labeled the grand bargain. But first, just a little bit of basic context about Vancouver. Um, it's similar, the, the, the city of Vancouver, similar size to Portland in population, about one third of the area. Regional population is about 2.8 million. Over the last 40 years, the city of Vancouver has been the slowest growing part of this region, um, which um, I hear a lot of really positive things about Vancouver when I, when I go elsewhere, especially in Cascadia. And I, maybe I'm here to burst a little of that bubble to some extent, because, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been mostly suburban growth over the last number of years. Um, and one way to see that is to look at the zoning map of the city of Vancouver. This is it in 1965, and this is it in um, 2015. And the point, of course, is that it's the same map. Um, what that doesn't show, though, is there was some significant development in the downtown area. And this is the old, some old industrial area in what's called Yale Town. Um, and through the 80s and 90s, a Hong Kong-based um, company called Concord Pacific bought up these old industrial lands for very little money, and they did this. And this is probably the photo you're used to seeing when you see Vancouver, and this is, um, this is kind of the perception of it. So that was, that was pretty extraordinary. Um, same timeline as the zoning map, but if you just take a step a little bit back, 1965, 2015, 1965, 2015. So you can see that Yale Town development. Um, and this is only from about 25th Avenue in Vancouver, which is still on the north end. If you went all the way back, there'd be a lot more green, green space. Um, so pretty normal, pretty normal kind of North American city with the single family neighborhoods still taking up most of it. I think we get a lot of press for the downtown stuff, well deserved, but um, that is only part of the story. So this is a, a quote that I think helps frame what's been going on in Vancouver for the last while from seven-term former city councillor Gordon Price. I think he was a councillor from 1988 to 2001. And he says that uh, from Expo 86 until the 2010 Olympics, Vancouver accommodated growth pressures on a small fraction of the city's land while avoiding the political unpleasantness of significant rezonings in built-out neighbourhoods. So that, that's how Gordon Price defines what he calls the grand bargain, which is a bargain between developers and new residents who get fit in these spiky little high density pockets here and there, mostly on old industrial lands, and then the, the single family areas which have their end of the bargain. And this is a political coalition that I think is breaking, that is broken. Um, I don't know that Gordon Price agrees, um, so I'm, I'm using his concept, um, but I don't know if, you know, he might not subscribe to everything I'm about to say about it. Um, so that's the grand bargain. Li I think we need a little bit more context about Vancouver. This is the only text-heavy slide, I'm sorry, but it's just, I think it's some basics that, that um, if you're not from there, in, in, you know, down here in the US, that we need to talk about. Um, so, you know, one vision of Vancouver, again, is it's, you know, this urban, transit-oriented demand wonderland with trains, aut automated trains running every two minutes and um, a carbon tax, which we have, nobody talks about. Um, it's not really a political issue anymore, so those of you who are thinking about something like that um, can maybe take a lesson. Um, I almost didn't put the carbon tax in here because it doesn't, it's just not a politically salient issue at this point in, in BC. Um, and lots of bike lanes, but it's really expensive. Um, I've talked about the multipolar grand bargain. Um, again, just basic stats. We build about 25,000 new units every year for the region, of which Five to 8,000 might be in the city of Vancouver, depending on the year. Very low property taxes, 0.3%. We do build a fair bit of uh, rapid transit by, the North, by North American standards anyway. Um, we were really early on small-scale intensification of single-family areas, legalizing basement suites in, way back in the 90s and laneway homes in, or ADUs in, in 2009. 
when we do these big towers, they're always very negotiated and there's a lot of money paid to the city. Um, some, some tower projects, single tower projects in the city of Vancouver can be up to 80 or $90 million of um, community amenity contributions. And, and finally, um, finally, really high immigration rates in Canada right now, which is gonna be interesting, about 430,000 um, for, for this year, which uh, by comparison in, um, in the 2010s, I think the US averaged about a million a year for a much larger country, and I think the U.S. has come down from, from that. Um, so it's really high immigration numbers, which of course is going to you know, be a, a huge issue for, for a, a city like Vancouver that's really popular with immigrants. Um, I, love, I love this little slide. It tells you a bit about what's going on in Vancouver. And, and one of the things I hope you might get out of this, because it's, it's, it's a lot of just here's what's happening in Vancouver. So in your own cities, maybe, you know, this is a slide I haven't seen in other cities. It's not, as it appears at first glance, a land use map. This is a map of, this is a chart, sorry, of how much new floor space gets constructed of, of which type in Vancouver. And as you can see, this is the city of Vancouver. Most new floor space that's built is single family homes. What that means, we're not, we don't have new single family land. We're not building new subdivisions. We're tearing down single family homes and rebuilding them at a really fast pace. Um, so I, I think this is a really powerful map um, chart um, because it, it kind of says, you know, we're, the, the talk in Vancouver is all we're building all these condos. Um, and, and it's just not true. We're tearing down and rebuilding really expensive single family homes. From an environmental perspective, it's, it's terrible. Um, and of course, from an affordability perspective, it's, it's not great either. Um, just a couple of quick, quick charts showing just how the region has grown over the past, past few years from an article I wrote for Sightline a little while ago. You can see the suburb of Surrey grew significantly faster over the last 40 five years than the city of Vancouver. A lot of that was um, greenfield development. Um, at, the, at the regional level, Vancouver's growth is just not a big part of the regional growth over that 45 year period. And, well, and looking forward or until to 2050, the current regional plan is again for Vancouver to be the slowest growing part of the entire region. Um, and part of that's gonna be a part of that suburban growth, a lot of that suburban growth, because those suburbs are significantly built out now, is gonna be this town center model that I've talked about already with these multipolar suburban tower districts. Well, again, just to come back to these um, earlier slides, this is the story you hear about Vancouver, but this is, um, this continuity um, rather than change is probably more of what's happened. Um, as you can see again, just one more way of putting it, downtown Vancouver had by far the, the, the biggest growth. Again, that's the repurposing of old industrial lands, mostly. Um, this is growth from, again, 45 years from 1971 to 2016. And if you look at the whole city, um, this is, um, again, the, the darker colors are faster growth. Notice out west there is really what I wanna show here, how there's in the west and the south, very little growth. Salem's gonna have some stuff to say about some of those western neighborhoods a, a little bit later. Um, but you'll see you'll have a thousand percent population growth in downtown. I don't know if you can read that. Um, but there's a thousand percent growth downtown. And um, um, Shaughnessy, which is right, that, that light spot right in the middle west, is minus 8.4% over that same time period. Um, this is another one that, um, that was a really helpful advocacy tool for us um, recently. We just, for a, for a broad rezoning policy in Vancouver, um, we looked up, um, uh, people um, are invited to put their neighborhood when they, when they put these in. So we just went through and we looked at which neighborhood correspondence was coming from um, on a citywide rezoning. And you can see that about half of it came from two neighborhoods along the beaches in the northwest part of Vancouver. And if you know Vancouver, you'll know that the west side is the wealthier part of Vancouver. Um, and if you know what Salem's gonna talk about, Kitsilano and, 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 and West Point Gray are the two neighborhoods where some of his really big projects are going to be going in soon. Um, so that's, um, um, 
that's going to be fun. But this, this was effective at city council. I think councillors really paid attention to this when you talk about consultation. And you're, you ask who you're consulting. So we just we made a map of, of where that consultation is coming from, and and um, that kind of you know you can see the whole south and east part of the city, which are um, more Chinese and, 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 and South Asian and, and more immigrants um, are just not really being consulted on these citywide rezonings. One more element of the grand bargain I wanted to talk about is the densification of arterials and only arterials, a half block off the arterials that remain single family homes typically for basically putting as many homes as we can on the busy streets and, um, and um, um, exposing people to as much pollution as we possibly can. This is kind of a subtype of the bigger grand bargain model where you, you, industri you identify the industrial lands, the shopping malls, and, and the busy streets, but you leave most of it alone. One thing that we've found pretty effective in talking to city councillors about and politicians at the provincial level as well, though, is saying that people, as more and more of the city lives in places like this, and I've lived um, in a place much like this for, for most of the past six years, is it's really unpleasant and people know it. Um, and just telling those stories again and again and again and showing them these photos and inviting them to these houses and saying like, look, like people don't want to live like this. And if you can instead offer them this, um, and we don't build much of this, they're really going to like you and they're going to, they're going to vote for you more. Um, and th 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 this, um, again, I think Lucille might talk about this with one city, but this stuff's actually, um, really exciting for people, um, and getting people, um, out of this and into this is a really p compelling political message and we're starting to see some, some, some politicians really come around to that idea. Um, you, of course, can also go look at the old stuff, pre-zoning where we used to build that, that, that other excellent stuff. So, where are we going in Vancouver? Um, some new things that have happened um, that some of you may have heard about um, and I think will be helpful for some of your own local conversations as well. Some people say, you know, let's not, uh, let's not densify yet because um, we haven't tried everything else. We need to get rid of those, those foreign buyers and those empty homes and all those old things. So you can just point to Vancouver, hopefully, and say Vancouver did all of that from 2016 to 2018, and our prices are higher than ever. Um, some of the taxes are good. I think, I think the empty homes tax and speculation and vacancy tax did return some number of units to the rental market that, that were previously empty. It wasn't a game-changing amount. They're fine taxes. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't oppose them. Um, Politically, it was really interesting as well to see um, the foreign buyers tax was a really big deal politically. The government um, that came in um, shortly after it, that had the, the, the new leftish, um, new Democratic Party government in BC that didn't implement it but was kind of credited with it um, um, has found a lot of political success after that to the point where in the housing budget last week, I think it was, that the Fed, the federal government brought in under Justin Trudeau, one of their two marquee policies for housing was a federal foreign buyer ban. Um, so I think, you know, I could, maybe I could take my own advice and, 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 and you know, I say point to BC, so it, didn't, it didn't work there. Well, I mean, I, I, I should probably say that to Justin Trudeau because um, it didn't work for reducing housing prices, but it seems to have worked politically. And I think that maybe that's the lesson that Justin Trudeau took from that. Um, I think I've mentioned briefly as well, there's a lot of newfound interest, and we could do a whole session on this, uh, in, at the provincial level in upzoning. The provincial housing minister in British Columbia is talking about um, limiting municipalities' abilities to, to say no to all kinds of projects. And he's up there, like, it's great. He's, um, he's saying things that we've been saying in the news for the last five years, um, which is, um, I'm just going to skip to the next slide because that's, Something I wanted to talk about in terms of strategy wise is something we've found as at Abundant Housing Vancouver found really effective and we've been able to do I think pretty successfully is have people like David Eby, the housing minister, one of the most popular politicians in the province, up there saying our stuff. He's not saying our name, he's not referring to us, we're not even taking credit. I and mean, it's way better that way. And we, 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 we really focus a lot on having different messengers um, say our say our stuff, and we rarely we, we don't look for credit. It's actually better if we're not involved, because as as you may know, um, not everyone loves Yimbies. People don't always love that slo that that slogan. Someone might not love me. Um, there's often a better messenger. So, um, 
that's what I mean by a multi-pronged strategy and new, letting new allies do it their own way. And we don't reach out really and say like, hey, you didn't do this right or you could have done this differently. We're like, you know, it's just great that they're up there um, saying the stuff that, uh, it's better that they're saying it than, than that we are because different people are gonna listen to them. And some of them have much bigger platforms than we do. Um, so finally, some fun photos of the Grand Bargain in Vancouver suburbs. None of these are in downtown Vancouver. Only one of them is in the city of Vancouver. They're neighborhoods of between 12,000 and Metro Town, the kind of second downtown, is gonna be about 80,000 people. Um, the bottom left one at Lowhe Town Center, the tallest tower will be 82 stories. Um, and these are mostly shopping mall redevelopments. Um, and I, I just think it'd be interesting for this crowd because I don't know a lot of maybe any other North American cities who are doing stuff like this, but this is a huge part of uh, Vancouver's growth. Um, and then finally, this, uh, this kind of sums up um, housing policy in Vancouver. You have a probably two or three million dollar detached home that looks like it's about to be torn down most likely, or maybe they're just rebuilding the fence. But based on the, the land value to building value ratio, this house is not long for the world, and then behind it you have these, these big towers going up. So we have this really spiky, um, multipolar, suburbanized um, um, development. I would rather see kind of four floors and corner stores, I don't know where Laura, Laura Lowe is, or six, six floors and corner stores. That's not what we're doing in Vancouver. Um, we're talking about doing six plexes in the city of Vancouver, which won't be affordable. That ship has sailed. I was in a, uh, a panel about Portland the other day. People were talking about the rents they can achieve on six plexes in Portland, and it sounded great. Um, it's not an option for us for, for affordability at our land prices. So we, we'd have to go a fair bit taller, and we are, but again, we're doing it in this, in this really spiky kind of multipolar way. Um, and I hope that leads into what Kul Salem's gonna talk about because he's going to, um, he has some really remarkable projects that are like and, and unlike the, the um, grand bargain that we've been doing for a while. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, can we please switch back to Kul Salem and then he can go ahead and share his screen and his presentation and talk about what he's been doing. Okay, so I'm gonna hopefully try and start off by sharing a video. Um, which I hope will work. Um, oh no. Okay, can you see the video? Yes. Okay, and I'm gonna hit play, and hopefully you can, I'm just gonna play a minute of this um, uh, ad that came out uh, this week that has generated a lot of discussion in Canada, um, but particularly in Vancouver, because this, this is a conservative politician who is in a leadership race to lead the conservative party uh, in Canada. Um, conservatives in Canada and Republicans are, are pretty different through a number of different metrics. But what's interesting about this is, I'll talk about in a sec, and then I'm gonna, I'm, I'm planning to actually start talking about my sort of uh, volunteer uh, activism and, and work uh, around housing policy and then end focusing on the First Nations aspect because there's a lot at that intersection uh, that the work that Abundant Housing and Danny have done um, but also just my own sort of thinking about how, why I do the things that I do and my views on it. So hopefully this works. Want to see a $5 million house here in Vancouver? You can feast your eyes on the home of your dreams. Here it is, $4.8 million is the listing price for this baby. Now, before I go any further, let me acknowledge that a realtor would tell you you could tear it down and build more units on it. The uh, place next door appears to have about six units on a similar footprint of land. So let's say that you get six units right here. Well, that works out to $800,000 for every single unit just in land cost. But then, of course, you'd need materials and labor to build, and you'd need all the government permits and building, uh, and building approvals from City Hall. So that means that each unit is going to be over a million dollars, a million dollars for the privilege of living in a multi-unit housing situation that would uh, ultimately mean a mortgage for many people of $950,000. Who can afford payments on a $950,000 mortgage? Forget property taxes and utilities. Why is it that Vancouver has the third most unaffordable housing market on planet Earth ahead of Manhattan, Los Angeles, London, England, and even Singapore? All places with more money and people, but less land. Why? Well, partly because um, okay. 
So he goes on to blame Ottawa and the current sort of uh, government that's been in power for about five years and all this kind of stuff. But a um, couple of interesting things about this that I sort of want to highlight. So he, he picks Vancouver as a target, um, which is interesting in the context that Danny's talking about um, where one of the first Canadian cities to create below, below market housing and private projects through extra density or inclusionary zoning uh, one of the first cities to bring in an empty home tax. Um, most options uh, currently of any Canadian city for extra units and house with yard zones like basement suites, laneways, duplexes. Vancouver has a strong record of sort of backing social housing projects, even in some of the more richer affluent neighborhoods like Dunbar uh, for the last 30 years has a requirement of 30% affordable housing in some of the large projects. It's given and used millions and millions of dollars of its revenue to fund social housing projects, either by giving land or, or giving it to different projects. Um, and yet Vancouver, despite all of those firsts and despite all of those innovative approaches and despite all of the things that they've tinkered with around the edges, um, cumulatively, all of those efforts have not created much of a dent in either reducing uh, the rising cost of housing um, whether it's to purchase a home or whether it's to rent. Um, we, have, we do have vacancy control in the form of allowable annual increases in, in British Columbia, but um, through people moving and, and, and moving from one location to the other, uh, properties will rise in rent quite significantly. I know one person that just moved out of a two-bedroom apartment um, in Kitsilano, somewhat the more af somewhat of an affluent, but a lot of renters, but has a limit on density for the last uh, 30 years, um, was paying 2,700 for a two bedroom. Um, and it re is back out in the market now for 3,400. Um, so that's the increases that, you know, landlords are able to do between tenants. Um, but you can see the type of increases that are happening on a large scale. So what's, I think, part of the work that I've been involved in that's been informed by a lot of the development work that my nation's doing, the economic analysis that I've been able to have the fortunate opportunity to learn is um, that the constraint on new housing um, that our region and really the city of Vancouver puts on land use, uh, the grand bargain that, that Danny is talking about is one of the biggest contributors to the unaffordability that occurs across the housing spectrum. Um, however, despite this, there's you know some pieces that are, are aligning now. Um, the city of Vancouver passed a, passed a climate plan, talks about a big move that by 2030, 90% of people live within an easy walk or roll of their daily needs, otherwise known as a complete community. Um, they, there's uh, proposals to sort of allow for six plexes on a lot with some sort of affordability mechanisms or some value capture tools to generate revenue that could go towards affordable housing initiatives. Um, Vancouver, relative to a lot of American cities, does actually quite a bit at capturing land lift um, through new development, places a lot of fees and taxes on new development in order to try and fund other types of housing and uh, affordable projects. Um, but, um, the, the big need is to actually allow for um, housing to be built um, to meet the actual needs of the city and the region um, in order to create you know, that type of communities that we want to see in Vancouver um, that are, have much greater form of affordability and allow for more people to live here. You know, we have vacancy rates below 1% um, across different sort of uh, housing uh, unit types and stuff like that, but... <clears throat> um, you know, the dream of home ownership is still deeply popular among all age categories in Canada, including millennials, where in 2020, 72% of millennials in Canada uh, said in a KPMG survey that, uh, that one of their goals was to own a home one day. Um, and research obviously indicates, good research indicates that building middle priced housing increases affordability through filtering as some lower priced units occupants move into more expensive units and over time as the new houses depreciate and become cheaper. Um, and then, you know, just speaking to the housing economics that I think everybody's sort of familiar with, which is, you know, upzoning leads to higher price, higher per acre land prices, but lower per housing unit land prices, and it lowers housing costs. The greater number of the units, the lower the cost per unit on the acre of land. Um, 
And to give a bit of context again to what Danny is speaking to, in Vancouver in the 1970s, at an average of 12.8 housing construction completions per 1,000 people, but in, 2010, in the 2010s, it was 7.7. Um, so we were almost we were building almost double uh, the amount of completions on average in the 70s compared to uh, the 2010s uh, per 1,000 people. That means that there were 66 more completions per capita in the 70s in total numbers. We averaged 18,693 completions a year in the 2010s. But if Vancouver had been building at the same rate as the 1970s, it would have been building almost three times that at 31,000. So over those 10 years, that's a difference of 120,000, 125,000 units. So Vancouver has a housing shortage. We're not building enough. Um, and uh, that's sort of one of the big debates that happens here, of course. People think that we are building enough or we're building too much. Um, and, you know, the single family home zone neighborhoods that abundant housing has been sort of raising um, the policy debate about, it, you know, has been described as socialism for the rich by UBC economist Tom Davidoff where large swaths of the city of Vancouver are restricted to the construction of the most expensive form of housing. And it has seen the greatest increases in value, uh, which is a gift to affluent buyers and owners from the public through maintaining status quo land use rules. Um, rents last year jumped uh, 21% from 2021 to 2022 and are expected to rise you know, into the future. So you know, these are the contexts where the region is operating off of. Now, what's... Um, a contradiction for, for me is, um, on one hand, if I was to be, if we were to be extremely successful at changing uh, the land use rules across the city and the region um, to actually address uh, the needs of the city, it would largely make the economic development projects that my nation is doing around building housing much less economical. There's, there's an incentive here for the city to constrain supply because it means that my nation's probably going to make a lot more money to be able to charge um, a premium on rents. You know, we're essentially going to be a landlord and we're going to collect rents, market rents off of our developments um, to generate significant revenue windfalls to fund social programs. We are a government, just like a municipal government or a provincial government or a federal government, uh, and we're using uh, economic development initiatives that I'll talk about in a sec to generate billions of dollars in revenue. But if the uh, vacancy rate were to go to, say, 7%, um, we would be competing against uh, thousands and thousands of landlords, property managers, uh, for tenants to occupy our buildings. We might have to reduce rents. We might have to offer incentives. We might have to have a significant challenge generating the revenue streams that we are currently predicting. Um, and I know from our development projects that this is how uh, you know the development community operates. We are looking at a estimated uh, revenue stream at price per uh, fo a square foot. You know, it's, is it gonna be $3.75 a square foot or $4 a square foot, $4 and a quarter a square foot? Depends on area that you're operating a building and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so the reason I, I sort of provide that context is there is um, you know, solutions to our affordable housing context, but the culture of experimenting with policy, the culture of incrementalism, the culture of sort of fiddling around the edges on these policy debates has created this situation. And we're heading into, again, another significant crisis um, with regard to housing. And it's going to create uh, a lot of opportunity for politicians to align themselves with the outrage, with the demands, the crisis, um, that comes up and I think we see it that the conservative one conservative candidate is sort of identifying that we see um, on the other side of the spectrum as as Danny mentioned the Minister of Housing here in our province also taking up rezoning and the speed of, uh, of construction completions uh, the, the inability for cities and municipalities to, to allow enough housing to happen though you know we have basically the Socialist Party and the Conservative Party also speaking around the same problem. Um, but then we also have forces on both sides of the political spectrum advocating against those solutions too, where we're one of the most right-wing councillors in the city of Vancouver is against new density in most forms um, on both the left and right political spectrum. And we have left and right political leaders in our city council who advocate for more housing and more neighborhoods too. So it's, you know, it crosses that bipartisanship or multi-partisanship, I think. But here's where First Nations come in, and I think are also changing the game 
in the Vancouver context. Um, so let's pull up my slides to give a bit of context. So I'm from a First Nation, otherwise I think the American context would be a tribal nation or a tribe. There are three nations here in Vancouver that have overlapping homelands. Um, I'm actually just gonna turn on this, hopefully that worked, there we go. Um, so three nations, I'm from the Squamish Nation. We're the largest of the three. We have about 4,000 uh, citizens. Uh, Musqueam uh, on the blue line has about 1,500, 1,600 citizens and Tsleil-Waututh has about five to 600 citizens. So three nations, each with its own jurisdiction and own government has its own elections. Um, operates independently of other, each other, but due to the overlapping uh, claims to the territory where we operate in a country where the crown, otherwise um, is the, the state, like the nation state of Canada, uh, forces First Nations to try and prove that we had a title to the land, which is recognized within our constitution. Uh, and just to give a bit of context in the Canadian situation, we don't have legal concepts of tribal sovereignty like the US does where tribes that own res reservation lands are able to exercise a significant amount of jurisdiction over those lands uh, outside of state control. Um, we are, um, we are uh, governed by federal and provincial laws in some circumstances um, and we don't have full tribal sovereignty over our reserve lands, um, but we have something else, which is we have constitutionally protected rights and recognition of title throughout the entire territory, not just the reserve lands. And we've been able to leverage that, which sort of has been defined by case law through the Supreme Court over 20 or 30 years, where it forces the government, the Crown, whether at federal or provincial level, that they have to accommodate uh, First Nations when our rights are gonna be impacted. So one way that we've leveraged that is when the feds and province had attempted to sell land that was state owned or owned by the government, when they attempted to sell it off to the market, my nation, the three nations came together and said, wait a sec, you can't do that. These are our lands, the title is ours and then Crown asserts their title. Um, and if you try to sell these lands, we're gonna take you to court and we're gonna stall uh, your sale for 10 or 20 years. Uh, you won't be able to see any profits off of it um, anytime soon, and it's going to hold up uh, a lot of, uh, of issues for the government. So because of that leverage, we negotiated for a number of parcels to actually come back to our nation. Um, through a purchase, we basically negotiated a fair market price uh, uh, for those lands um, on a vendor take-back agreement that has been offered to a lot of private developers where we don't have to pay back that purchase price uh, in some cases until 2032 or even beyond. Um, and so the sort of economics is we get the land, we go through a development process, we generate significant revenue off of it and then use a portion of that to sell off back to the government to pay for the land, but then any windfall profits uh, come to the nations um, that we can use to fund government programs and services. But here's a couple of examples. We have the Heatherlands, which is uh, like on a 20 acre site these are some recent schematic designs that have come out, um, you know, trying to incorporate a lot of First Nations culture and ideas and concepts into them. It's a lot of um, strata uh, leasehold. Uh, so the other intention is that as we've acquired these lands, we're actually not selling them off to the private market as, as condos, um, or as strata condos, but as strata leasehold. So it means that they're only for 99 year leases. And after that time period, these units would come back to the possession of the nations and we could either redevelop or, or resell depending on the state of the buildings. So they're all leasehold properties. Um, and then, you know, a few other examples of some of the buildings and designs is the Heatherlands. We also have the Jericho lands, which are a little bit larger, um, about a 90 acre piece of land, um, former federal uh, military lands. There's really not a lot of, of housing on it. It's, it, there's a few sort of um, military use uh, buildings that, that were used, some, some other sort of facilities, but you can kind of see in the neighborhood, it's all single detached houses and then sort of largely vacant land going through. So both the Heather Street and the Jericho lands, because they're uh, fee simple lands or private lands, they're not on reserve, which means that we have to go through the city rezoning process in order to receive uh, the density uh, increase that we would need. Um, but lots of work happening to find the right density amount, the right 
built form amount, the design, et cetera. Et cetera. But you know, um, purchasing land for hundreds of millions, but potentially making billions and billions of dollars of profit over the entire development sort of timeline. Um, some recent sort of design schematics. This is in the Vancouver's West Side, one of the richest neighborhoods in Canada. Also, largely, um, uh, largely a un undeveloped part of Vancouver because most of the densification of Vancouver has happened on materials in the east side or in the downtown area. This is a pretty um, large sort of uh, break from the traditional sort of development plans of Vancouver. Um, you see these three towers here representing the three nations. Um, some more design schematics incorporating Squamish and Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh culture, values, and design practices. Um, but the other interesting thing about this is that we're including uh, a significant amount of, of rental, purpose-built rental, um, social housing that will be owned and controlled by the nation. There's about uh, 10 to 15% will be a purpose-built rental and 20% that will be inclusionary zoning in the form of, of social housing that will be retained by the nation to use how we want, whether it's to house our own members, largely low income. Um, the average, uh, I think the average median household income in Vancouver is like 57,000 and the average median income on my reserve is 26,000. <laughs> so to give you a sense of the poverty levels that, and the working poor levels that we have in my community, potentially lots of housing to, to support them as well through the development. This is a fact that was not acknowledged by a couple of critics of this plan recently, um, but is an important aspect of it. And also again, leasehold strata. We'll get um, thousands and thousands of these units back to our, our governments in a hundred years after it's built. So. And then it takes us to a different project, um, which is the Sanat project here in the context you can see um, it's also sort of behind me if I just move, you can look. Um, but a sea of, of single detached here on the side, like here uh, at the bottom in this picture, you can see downtown in the background, and you can see the proposed development and a little bit of how the downtown area is sort of coming across this little inlet here. Um, 11, 12 towers, tallest tower is 56 stories, smallest tower I think is around 34, 6,000 units on uh, 11 acres of land. Um, all purpose built rental um, with minimal car parking. So about a 10.7% uh, ratio, uh, like a one, or I guess one point, what is that? 1.1 to 10 uh, ratio of, of units to parking stalls. But there will be uh, over 6,000 uh, uh, bicycle parking stalls into incorporate into the site. So dense, but low parking um, located within about a 10 minute uh, 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 transit connection to the downtown core. You see some of the towers um, using a built form design uh, intending to sort of evoke traditional sort of uh, Squamish design motifs. Um, that's the downtown bridge. This is looking towards the downtown area. Um, so Sanak, very different, um, very unique, also built on reserve, which meant that me and my council we're the zoning authority, not the city of Vancouver city council. They don't have jurisdiction over federal lands. My council does. Um, and we've partnered with a, a private developer on a 50, 50 partnership to develop these units. They provide the sort of, um, financing and the development expertise. We are providing the land. Um, there's a bit of a inclusionary zoning requirement on this, uh, much, much, much smaller, but there is also a community amenity contribution. Um, requirements so the nation is generating about 240 million dollars in cash that's transferred to our government at the time of construction for each phase there's four phases so you know 240 over about six years um, we're anticipating starting construction this year um, on the first phase um, but you know this is this is a type of project that didn't receive a lot of pushback or criticism or opposition from organized sort of uh, resident neighborhood groups, although the local neighboring um, single detached neighborhood here called Kitts Point is, has, uh, there have been some sort of organizing and threats of lawsuits and things like that from them, but they don't really have a say because the city of Vancouver doesn't really control the zoning on the lands. My council does. Um, it doesn't go through a typical public hearing process or, or any kind of process with the city of Vancouver. We do have to negotiate a service agreement 
for access to municipal services like water and police and fire, um, hydro, sewage, things like that, um, which we have are close to doing, um, but just a very different type of development. And so <clears throat> the way I wanna sort of wrap this all up together is the, the, my nations are able to demonstrate what's possible when a government is actually able to intervene into the market using two things. One, our ability to control density on land we own or control, um, and, and to generate significant amount of windfall profits for us as a government. Um, none of the other governments in our region are doing this. The municipal government, provincial government, federal government aren't doing this at, a, at much of a scale. You know, there's efforts to build um, community-owned or nonprofit sort of affordable housing with different levels of income brackets, moderate income versus social housing with rent geared income. But we're, we're doing this explicitly to make a significant a profit. Now, there's sort of accusations that the leasehold strata or the purposeful rental is luxury, um, but the reality is um, both forms of housing are gonna provide a significant amount of housing for the middle class. Might not provide it for low income or moderate income, but these are gonna be middle class households who live in them, and they're gonna be filled up pretty quickly because we have a you know, 1% vacancy rate. So the, the point of this is I think that um, through the work of, of housing advocate groups like Abundant Housing, able to influence uh, the, thought, the thought leadership from both political leaders um, in First Nation and non-First Nations communities, uh, and then also through just the fact that my nation is doing these things, uh, we can demonstrate what's possible that um, tinkering around the edges and not being bold or big enough isn't really serving us, but also that it is possible to build dense communities um, that are quite livable um, and that governments could actually benefit from them a lot and do a lot of good things as a result. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there's still a huge need to um, address the, the housing needs, you know, the growth in jobs, the growth in population, which tend to be more lagging indicators um, through mass rezoning. And, you know, Danny talked about six floors and corner stores, which is something that, you know, um, you know, is being talked about a little bit more. When we talk to the nonprofit housing experts who built, who support and build actual affordable housing uh, through nonprofit housing, um, you know, four floors and corner stores is not economically feasible in most parts of Vancouver anymore because the land costs have gone up so much. You have to do six. Uh, in order for purposeful rental to work at that level. Um, but there's just such an untapped uh, ability for this city to both reap an, a, a significant amount of benefit from using its zoning power, um, but also the fact that we're just living in a really hot market that's really terrible for renters and also is increasingly becoming difficult for anybody to be able to, to be priced in, uh, to be able to purchase a home. So we need, you know, my view is that we, we the zero sum game that each of the advocates in the housing spectrum are at odds with each other uh, isn't working. That if we're advocates for low income housing or moderate income housing or middle class housing actually need to unite um, because the type of political change we need only comes about through that mass coalition building um, because um, we need each other in order to take on uh, the six, seven million dollar homeowners um, within the west side who often um, have an oversized role in influencing city hall politics around the level of density that is built within these developments. And hopefully my projects and the projects my nation is doing can also show what's possible at a large enough scale. Um, and, you know, others have pointed it out, might be sort of my last message is like, Sanok only exists at the density that it does well, one, because of the site constraints and sort of transportation, but we can only build that much housing, 6,000 units and 11 acres of land because the demand for housing is so high. That's the, only, that's the reason why we can do it as, a, as an economic development project. So there's um, multiple ways to solve that, but one of them is through mass rezoning. And it's, you know, I think it's, it's also reaching a point where uh, housing is popular, new housing is popular. Um, Vancouver recently did this massive sort of engagement around developing a land use plan for the whole city called the Vancouver plan, which I have lots of criticisms of, but there was data from the survey that came in um, that showed that housing is significantly popular um, with, with Vancouverites where 70, uh, yeah, um, results from the engagement around the Vancouver plan at, found that adding more housing choices in neighborhoods across the city was identified as the public's highest priority 
with over 75% of respondents supporting more equitable housing choices in all neighborhoods, and over 80% supported low-rise apartments up to six stories, multiplex and townhouses, in areas that are primarily single detached houses. 48% said mid-rises up to 12 are also acceptable. So housing's popular. Um, and, and some politicians are starting to figure out that this is going to be a defining issue of the generation. And I, I, you know, I'm excited about what my nation's doing to try and solve some of that, but it's, I think there's, there's a, a generational um, opportunity for, for a coalition to come together around these ideas um, and create that change that so many need. Awesome, wonderful, thank you so much for that. Um, just for context, we have about 19 minutes left. Um, so for one question I have for both of you is how did you start organizing together? <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll make Danny blush, um, or try to at least. Um, so 2017 is when the housing uh, market like took off. And I, I wish I had a slide right now that, that sort of highlights this, but um, housing prices and rents, um, like it, it goes to this, there's a graph that shows like Vancouver is steadily climbing and it was pretty unaffordable um, prior to 2017, but 2017 is when it like skyrockets. And all these sort of demand side sort of solutions sort of being talked about. So a lot of them were implemented and we're still on the same problem. But um, it was through my conversations with Danny and others that are connected to abundant housing that you know helped me understand the political economy around this housing land use uh, discussion. And, and frankly, I think Danny and a few others that are part of abundant housing helped me really connect the dots around some of these things. And then, and then frankly, through my experience and actually trying to build um, this housing, having it confirmed by the uh, experts that were advising us on these housing developments that these there's the political economy around it and the economics around it do line up and so i think having those two entry points through my work and then through my sort of politics um changed my view around this and made me realize that there was a big need to push a different conversation around this topic do you have anything to add danny uh <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think we, we came together, in, in my view, in two ways. Um, one, I think probably originally was through the one city municipal um, political party that Cole Salem's involved in. And they actually, in, say, the 2015 municipal election, they signed an open letter from something called the Coalition of Vancouver Neighborhoods mm -hmm. that was pretty much um, your standard fare, more community consultation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kind of like a left, left NIMBY kind, kind of thing. That was in 2015. And between 2015 and 2018, Abundant Housing actually um, spent a lot of time talking to one city people. Because um, we're like, look, these aren't really your values if you really think about what you're doing. Um, and um, I should say, I don't believe Cole Salem was involved in 2015. Um, so he doesn't, he doesn't wear that. I think he came, around, came along a little bit later. Um, but yeah, One City had a really incredible change of heart, and he can talk about that more than I can, where they, they lost some members, they lost some organizers who just, they, you know, the, the kind of left NIMBY people, but they took a stand and they said, no, this is what we want to do. This is, as Cole Salem said, this is popular, this is right, this is better for the city. And, um, and um, so we worked, we worked together on that transition, um, kind of just naturally over, over the past two years. Um, and then, um, yeah, the, the kind of just following the lead and cheerleading um, the Squamish Nations and the, the MST Development Corporation's projects. Um, we're not, Abundant Housing is not involved in those, but, you know, the, the proposals come, up, come out and we do our thing and kind of say, you know, write your letters, um, go to City Council, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, maybe I'd just add that uh, I, I got involved with One City in 2018, uh, just before and right after the last city election. And then we have another one coming up in October. Uh, I'm leading the platform development for One City right now. Um, Housing is going to be a big part of our sort of platform. Um, not going to share much right now, unfortunately, but stay tuned. Um, but it's true. I mean, One City at one point ran on this sort of like, we need neighborhood councils that actually decide what kind of density is allowed in those neighborhoods, right? Like a typical sort of um, more conservative preservationist stance. 
um, to uh, a slogan of every neighborhood for everybody um, and pushing for density in the west side. So, and, and our one city councilor that we have out of 10 has this one of the strongest records on supporting, you know, new housing and, and rental housing and social housing, nonprofit housing, co-op housing um, currently, so. Awesome. Um, so you guys are doing something that I personally have not seen anywhere else in any other city. Do you have any advice or insights into your organizing? I know you might have like a specific circumstance, but just from either of you for other groups that are pushing for abundant housing, tenants' rights, any of that. I mean, I think it's part, in terms of the, the, the big, the scale of the, some of the projects we talked about today, including the MSTs and, 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 and the Squamish Nation's own, but also just all across the region. I mean, I'm not sure it's, I wouldn't necessarily recommend the model as ideal as, as, as I talked about. Um, but I think, I mean, maybe the, 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 the takeaway is when you do get a spot where you can build, where there's less political pressure, um, maybe you can go all out. Like I think Vancouver started doing that in the in the 80s, and so there was a model locally that we could follow from Concord Pacific of just building towers in in, in Yale Town, um, and then people were like, oh yeah, like n not only was the development community like, oh we can make money off of that, obviously, but also the politicians were let were, you know realized, um, oh that like that kind of worked politically, um, and uh, maybe that's a lesson you can take to your own cities and say. Um, again, I don't really want to recommend it, but it's just easier. It's easier. You can leave the single family neighborhoods alone and have the spike, spiky development where you can get away with it. Um, my, my quick message on this is um, my overall politics have, have, have evolved over the last three or four years where I have a long sort of analysis around this, but I'll try to sum it up, which is, um, you know, I think, I think just like we see uh, sort of more conservative preservationist politics around land use happen across the political spectrum, we also see sort of pro-housing uh, politics happen across the political spectrum. But, you know, I earnestly come to this as, I don't know, privately a self-described leftist, as a democratic socialist. Um, I'm a big believer in government intervention in society and that the social safety net needs to be raised, you know, significantly and tax of billionaires, all that kind of stuff. Um, but my analysis on that has shifted where, you know, I think the left, um, especially in the Canadian context, but I think also in the American context, trade a lot in moral essentialist ideas. And we've deviated a lot within leftist organizing uh, away from materialist solutions. Um, you know, we're dealing with abstractions and we can't, and, and so, you know, we, we attract a small group of like-minded, you know, people within a bubble who trade in these sort of moralist uh, concepts like racial justice and intersectionality and, um, you know, um, decolonization even. And these, they're abstractions. And we actually don't talk to people who don't share our morals. Um, we don't talk to um, the material needs and conditions of the people we claim to be fighting for. Um, and I think if you do, um, you find out that, that materialist solutions to material needs and conditions uh, are actually really popular um, because you're actually listening to the voters or the people that you know, need to come together. And so I think my advice is, I think a lot of the stuff that Abundant Housing is doing and that my nation is doing is responding to material needs and conditions. And that's much more popular and more successful than trying to you know, convince um, an, a, a Chinese Canadian immigrant mom who lives uh, sort of in the Southeast Vancouver, um, who wants their kids to be able to afford a home in Vancouver and live close to them, you know, trying to pitch them on a, a concept of, of um, abstract notions of, of something isn't really gonna be as attractive to getting them to come out and support you as I think offering them a material solution. What's gonna benefit them or their close family? Wonderful. I'm personally just very kind of entertained slash intrigued by the concept of building what's basically a NIMBY nightmare, like massive buildings that are explicitly for profit and market rent in large part, and then putting that profit into benefiting the citizens of your nation. Like that is so intriguing to me as kind of just like upending what is good housing and what people 
think that ethical housing is. Um, I just personally, like, this is wonderful. Um, <laughs> um, I think we have a question from the crowd if you wanna go ahead. We have about 10 minutes, so I think we have maybe time for one or two questions. if you had thought about that question at all or done some other, other opportunities. Um, were you able to hear that full question? I think, no, okay, yeah, I, would you mind repeating? Repeat Um, and inspiring. And so the question is whether there are other applications in other metropolitan areas. I've, been, I've thought about that some myself, whether there are other chances to do things like the Squamish Nation has been doing in, in Kitsilano and um, other areas of Vancouver. And I'm wondering if you've come across other opportunities for um, similar kinds of developments in other metropolitan areas. I guess just quickly, there's a few other projects happening in Canada, but at a much, 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 much smaller scale. So I think Montreal has a First Nations group that's sort of attempting to do a single sort of building. Um, I think there's other few First Nations in some cities that are trying to do it, but again, just like single building sort of projects. So nothing at the scale that we're working on, but I know there's lots of First Nations who are interested. It's just, um, we sort of, we, I don't know, we, we, we've just, We've, we've approached this because Vancouver is, you know, a development city in many ways. It's just, it's part of, um, there's so much, to, you know, um, resources and capacity here to, to be able to adopt uh, some of this as a framework. But I don't know, I, I think that yeah, there's some lessons, I think there's just disagreements on this in some ways, but I think the notion that we're basically, we have a, a state owned company that's building market housing and then using that to generate revenue. That's, that is not a particularly, you know, groundbreaking idea. The idea of uh, the state creating companies to, to do certain things and generating um, value for its citizens and the society. And it, it's something that other governments in Canada haven't adopted yet, but it's something that we're doing. So maybe there's something there, I don't know. Do you have anything to add, Danny? Nope. Okay. All right, looks like we have another question. Hi, my name is uh, Alex Romlovich. I'm New York City based and a uh, huge fan of your guys' work on Twitter. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to say that um, uh, I, I think I'm really, I'm, I'm like extremely impressed with the, um, it seems like people in Vancouver have a grasp of land economics in a way that mainstream housing Twitter doesn't seem to necessarily fully understand that relationship between, you know, land rent per unit versus land rent per acre, you know, that, like, actually reasoning through that process, what de what density will pencil at what land prices and understanding all that. Um, and I, um, you know, so I was, is, is there, um, like, uh, is there like a, a Georgist movement or a land value taxation movement, kind of modern, you know, like that, uh, the, you know, in, in Vancouver, and um, I was curious, to, did the, um, the the lease the leasehold approach reminds me of kind of modern Georgism as expressed in kind of Hong Kong Singapore and Battery Park City in New York, where you know that you have the 99 year leasehold in in lieu of property taxes excess revenue goes to the city or the nation in, in your case um, yeah I'm I'm curious like you know basically what what kind of um, economic background is you know informing this like truly incredible plan. 
Um, so on, on the property tax, land value capture, Georgia stuff, I'm keeping out for my, my next sightline article, which is almost <laughs> ready. I can't, I really, I wanted it out for the conference. Because um, Vancouver, as I mentioned, has some of the lowest property taxes anywhere. Um, so I wouldn't say we're a great, great Georgia city, but um, in terms of, I think your question about how we got people to realize those questions about land economics is we didn't really, I don't, we didn't frame it in economic terms. We, we just, but in housing anyway, we just really beat the drum of you can't afford single family homes. You can't afford single family homes. Why are they doing this? There's a rule that says only single family homes. You can't afford it. And then it, the, 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 you know, we also, um, um, when, when the really great NIMBYs say really great things, we also like, you know, we're like, look, and this is why, because they're listening to these people. Mm -hmm. So we, we went to values, we went to, you know, material conditions, like Hossein was talking about, like, you can't afford housing, it's because you're legally barred from having the kind of housing that you can afford in most of the city. And from that kind of value basis, I think people kind of, can kind of like, work out in some way the kind of cost of a unit versus cost of a land thing. It just helped, I think, I think that helped people maybe conceptualize that by just saying like, yeah, wait, I can't afford um, 4,000 square feet of land. Um, so why is that the only option? Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that. Um, and I think that's a big challenge. I mean, I, I think <laughs> your assessment that Vancouver gets this is probably a bit generous. Um, uh, because I think our housing debates are <laughs> not reflective of that understanding. I mean, my message to people um, is like, we should be taking um, housing policy advice from the people who actually build it. Um, and my nation's building it. Um, not Nonprofit housing providers are building it. And yeah, the profit market development's also building it. But like, let's stop taking advice on housing uh, and land use from people who don't build housing because <laughs> um, they're not the experts who know how to do this. Um, I think that there's lots to be said around experts around like, you know, tenant protections and relocation policies and stuff like that because tenants go through those, those experiences and have uh, undignified experiences with that and that's fair. But, you know, let's take advice, you know, in a pandemic we listen to the public health officials. So in a housing crisis, who should we listen to? Um, but there was a second part of your question that I was going to respond to, um, but I can't remember it now. But I mean, maybe the leasehold model that you guys are looking at. The oh yeah, year. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a bit like the Singapore model in, in in some ways, and and we're intentionally doing that. But that really comes from our values. Like it, it's just straight up. Um, I don't know how to put it other than the First Nations of this country are not interested in giving up our land. <laughs> like, it's just like, <laughs> we're not, right? So, and you know, I probably don't have to explain why, but once we got it back, we're not gonna give it up. So, you know, there's a lesson there too, um, in, in terms of how the city uh, and governments operate, so. I mean, they can give it up. They just have to give it up to us. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. So I think that we are officially probably out of time. I want to thank you guys so much for coming and giving this presentation. For me personally, as you know, a local abundant housing person, it was really illuminating. And uh, thank you so much. Is there any like very short last remarks? Maybe like thirty seconds. Danny, go for it. Um, I, you know, something that came to me that was responsive to both, both of the um, audience questions, I think, that I um, wish I'd said while I was here. There is another local model that's a little bit like this in some ways. I don't know if you'll agree, um, but the UBC, the University of British Columbia, has a lot of land, and they do a lot of leasehold, and they've made a lot of money and built quite a big endowment for a public university off of this kind of model. Um, so I guess that's another example of a kind of government institutional um, um, you know, it's not only the Squamish and the MST that can use their land to, to make a lot of money for other, other public ends. Um, it's, it's a model that's out there for any government with land, I think. Um, yeah, I guess, um, I don't know what to say other than that. I, I think, I think we're about to enter a very, very critical, like, 
We're, we're about to enter again a once in a lifetime opportunity for Yimbis to seize the moment because we're entering into a crisis. Uh, in the Canadian context, we're probably going to enter a wave of austerity after um, you know the last two years of our government spending hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in a giveaway to individuals and corporations, and they're going to run out of money for affordable housing. You know, they're going to say, "Oh, we don't have much more money, and you know our budgets are maxed out, and our debt is at this much, and all kind of stuff." So, question is, how do we how do we build uh, enough housing for the needs that we have when when it's an austerity uh, time period. And my, my main message is, as we learn through the pandemic, um, crisis of any kind opens up opportunities to do different things because the people who are in crisis just want action to, re to reduce uh, the harm that's being caused by the crisis or to reduce the risks or reduce the threats that the crisis is producing. So we're entering into, at least in the Canadian context, but I think probably around the world, um, deepening, deepening, deepening affordability issues and gap between income and uh, well, income gaps and wealth gaps. And it's just an opportunity for us to really press the advantage with the solutions that, you know, are the right solutions. Um, but we need to, to be successful at convincing enough people that this is the way to go and, and to organize enough people to, to get behind them. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.